Welcome everybody, good evening. It's a pleasure and an honor to welcome you all here for this event that is a presentation of a publication that Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung New York office just published. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to welcome the authors. Uh, we are proud to present uh, Anders Strat and Michael Menza, who will be in uh, uh, in conversation with Ashley Dawson. Uh, before we start, allow me to say some uh, words about the, our organization for those who are not familiar with it. Uh, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung is an international operating uh, non-governmental organization. We work on uh, civic education and political research. We are uh, dedicated to support and foster progressive thinking on both sides of the Atlantic. We are based, the headquarter is based in Berlin, Germany, and the New York office is the office for the United States, Canada, and the United Nations. And in this sense, I think uh, the work that we present today is a very good example for transatlantic exchange of pro progressive uh, thinking and for contesting the neoliberal mainstream. Is it still the mainstream? I think it's still the mainstream, but uh, we are working on it. And uh, democratizing public services is still a very timely issue. Uh, that's why we were glad to, um, to have uh, two uh, really high level authors to write on this issue and to write on their experiences. Um, and they will now introduce us into this publication and talk about the issue in a broader sense. And I guess we will also have time to discuss with some Q and A's afterwards. But without further ado, thank you very much for joining us again. And uh, thank you, Anne, Michael, Ashley for being with us and I hand the floor over to Ashley, who will lead us to the evening, through the evening. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Andreas. Um, and thank you, Aaron, for um, introducing us and, and hosting us. It's really great to be with everybody. And I'm so excited to be in conversation with Anne and Mike this evening about their important publication. Um, uh, on democratizing public services. Um, so this is obviously an extremely pressing um, publication and an extremely important moment. I think in the course of our conversation, we'll have a chance to discuss why that is in more detail. Um, but the first question I wanted to, to ask of both of you, um, and maybe you can talk a little bit uh, about yourselves and, and how you got together in the context of answering this question. Um, why did you both feel the need to do this project at the present moment? Um, so that's for both of you, but I would love it if you could start us out, Anne. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, your invitation. And I thank you very much for uh, Rosalie Sambod Stiftung. And thank you, Mike, and thank you, Ashley. Uh, for organizing this conversation. So why it's important at that moment, uh, how can I say, you know, I, just before the, the webinar, I told uh, Mike, uh, Mike and uh, Aaron that, uh, you know, yesterday it was the first uh, election day for the presidential election in France, and it's just a disaster. It's a disaster for, yes, for the left and for the, Ecology, the Green Party, and uh, and why I say that. So the point is, is a disaster because we we have a very uh, very uh, high percentage for the far right, so around thirty percent. So it's, it's just a nightmare. And and the point is, I think that so many people now first have a, a lot of difficulties in making ends uh, to meet and just to, to live. And also they have like, you know, a big gap. Uh, and I think bigger and bigger gap uh, between people and the elected official and the politicians and like an elite, even us, I consider that I'm 
I, I am, you know, a member of the elite. So for me, it's important as a politician to, to figure out how we can uh, connect again, you know, uh, connect again with, uh, yes, with, with, with people just to, and to push forward a progressive agenda. And for me, progressive agenda is partly funded for um, public services, uh, because I think it's a very, very important part uh, for, yes, for left policy, public services, and also how we can uh, revitalize, revitalize, so revitalize democracy. So I think, and especially I see not, not only in France, but you know, our democracy, I think are in the end of the cycle. And uh, so public services and democratization, I think is a key issue, not the only one, of course, but I think it's key issue. So for, I, I think for me, it's very, it was very important uh, with my background of, uh, of elected official and uh, implement, uh, having implemented, you know, public policies and to, and to discuss with also academics and like Mike, uh, and to have this uh, interesting back and forth, uh, insightful uh, discussion to say, okay, between academics and politicians, we need to find uh, innovative uh, thinking uh, about uh, politics and how we can, yes, in increase democracy, improve our public policy. So, so for me, it's, it's, a, it's also an important uh, a moment, a right moment to, to do that. Uh, thanks, Ashley. And, uh, and Anne, I think you, you really hit a number of the dimensions right on the head. Uh, and, and first, I just want to thank Rosa Luxemburg and for all their support for this publication and, uh, and the studious stewardship of Aaron Eisenberg, who helped us navigate the, the difficult rapids. This was a hard piece to, to, to write. Um, as important and, and as central as this issue is, a lot of the issues are very technical. And as Anne said, you know, one of the exciting things for me, having learned about what was, you know, the innovations in the Paris water utility, which we'll talk about later, um, was to work with Anne and to really combine, you know, I'm an academic. I was also the president of the nonprofit, the Participatory Budgeting Project. I've been working with, with cities and states on doing actual democratic processes for many years in the context mainly of the United States. Anne's coming at it from you know, someone who was in charge of the water utility in the French context. And so there was really some, some very, I think, provocative and provo productive um, synergies that emerged out of us, you know, us two collaborating. And we really see this as the beginning of a project, uh, as we'll discuss. I mean, the reasons for doing it, there's a new one every week. I mean, Anne just said it, right? There's a new disaster, or a new opportunity, literally every other week. Um, there's the climate crisis. There's the democracy crisis. There's this so-called contest between authoritarianism and democracy. What do we mean by democracy, right? We, 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 we spend time on this conflict and talking about how there are odds. We don't spend nearly enough time about talking about what democracy needs to look like in this moment. And, you know, in terms of the crisis, uh, you know, I'm reading about water rationing in Chile this morning. We're looking at uh, potential water rationing in California uh, and, and, and in the West because of the extensive drought there. Who's making these decisions, right? What are the decision processes that are going to have to be in place on this really scary dimension of the crisis? And when we talk about democracy, uh, as Anne mentioned, you know, I've been a professor and researcher um, as well as an activist and practitioner in this space for a long time. And for me, democracy is not just about having a voice, it's about sharing power. We gotta get beyond this idea, it's just about having voice. It's gotta be the nitty gritty of what is collaborative shared authority look like? What does collaborative governance look like? We're not romanticizing it. We're not saying you can just go to an assembly and it's fixed. Uh, it takes a lot of work to think this through. And I think that both of us have uh, different types of experience, but a pretty broad experience in, in coming to this space. And, and for me, I've been working a lot with New York City government on climate change and climate resilience uh, with the Science and Resilience Institute at Jamaica Bay, which is part of CUNY. And so there's that, there's participatory budgeting, my experience there. And also, you know, something that Anne and I have common uh, was, you know, the kind of experience of the water wars in Bolivia 
uh, a couple decades ago now as a kind of flashpoint around what a, a democratic public utility could look like and the, you know, the, the innovation around that, but also they kind of hit the wall. Um, and Paris, in a sense, maybe picked up the ball and, and moved it into a different place to keep that ball going forward. How do we bring that ball to the United States and get it going forward? So these were a lot of the things that, uh, that really brought me to the space and to this collaboration with Anne. Great, thank you both. Um, yeah, a very, very pressing moment. And the climate crisis is definitely here uh, already on so many different fronts, but um, it's important to think about it in terms of water. Um, uh, you know, I was born in Cape Town. I don't know if folks remember, but a couple of years ago, um, there was the specter of um, my home city actually running out of water. And so uh, questions of social justice, who got access to water figured re really prominently. Um, Mike, you referred to the water wars in Bolivia. For those who don't know about the water wars, um, they were such a strong example of kind of dominant neoliberal mentality playing out around the world, right? Um, because the public water supplies in Cochabamba and uh, other parts of Bolivia were privatized, handed over to big multinational firms. They were even taxing um, uh, people's uh, rain collecting. You know, when they collected it, uh, the rain that ran off the eaves of their roofs in barrels, they would have to pay some kind of tax. Um, and that, that led to tremendous ferment. But I think it raises the question um, of, uh, in the most kind of concrete way, why public utilities are best, better than investor-owned ones. Um, and, and particularly in the United States, that is such a, a kind of complex and hard question to, to answer because um, kind of neoliberal mentality uh, is so strong uh, as a result, particularly of the Cold War and of kind of anti-socialist ideas in, in the US. So. Um, why is it so important to have public owned utilities? Um, uh, I'll start, start again with Anne um, uh, for that question and then go to Mike. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Um, you know, my, I was elected uh, and uh, I was elected in 2001. And for 13 years, I was in charge of uh, the water and sanitation police, uh, yes, policy in Paris. And we, we succeeded to remunicipalize uh, the water service in Paris. And, and now we, we have a, a tangible and concrete experience of public management. And we can compare uh, with the, the former private one. And our, our vision, when, when we decided to remunicipalize uh, the water service in Paris, our vision was to manage uh, the water as a common good. Of course, it's not totally and it's not perfectly managed as a common good, but it was our vision and ensure a democratic and transparent management of the service and uh, implement a, a policy following the principle of sustainability, so social and environmental sustainability and the rise to public services. And we, we have the demonstration right now that it works. So now, uh, 12 uh, years after uh, we remunicipalize, uh, Eau de Paris, so Eau de Paris now is a publicly, so 100% uh, publicly owned utility for, for the water, for all the cycle of, of water uh, operation. And Eau de Paris uh, guarantees uh, high quality water at a true cost. What does it mean? It, it means that now the rate or the price paid by the consumers uh, reflects uh, transparently and the sole cost of water. So all profits are systematically reinvested in the whole utilities activities. And I think it's a very important uh, point. And it's a big, big difference uh, with the private management. And the impact, the, consequence, the, conse the consequences for that, we succeeded to decrease uh, the rate of water by 8%. And, uh, and still now, uh, 12 years after, uh, the, the price of water is still below than it was before. Uh, we insource the billing, the end user service, 
and, and taking the control over billing means getting control of the revenue of the service. So it's very important. We have, uh, we innovated uh, for the customer. We have now a new customer service. And, and uh, in fact, we were awarded to, to innovate a lot for that. We have more than 87% of customer satisfaction. We, we increase water accessibility for all. We decided to ban the uh, cut, water cutoff, water cutoff. Uh, we carry out strategic plan for uh, resource preservation and biodiversity conservation. Uh, we, we uh, and, but I think it will be maybe the, the following question. And we improve, uh, of, of uh, not only improve, uh, we decided to implement uh, and set up a new governance, uh, much more democratic. So if I, I make the, the story, uh, the long story short, I, I, I would say that, you know, for social, environmental sustainability, for uh, the democratization of the service, uh, for, for the long-term vision, for the, even for the technic, technical efficiency, we prove that it's better to have a public management than a private management. And that's why now, e even the, the right opposition, you know, even the, op yes, the municipal opposition, uh, the right-wing opposition, very, of course, uh, very uh, against our, our policy, now, Nobody wants to to go back. So for me, it's a it's a important uh, a proof of success. So now, no one uh, asks to reprivatize uh, the public uh, the water service in Paris. More accountable to the public, better for the workers. Workers tend to have more power, more stability in a publicly owned entity, water or, or electricity. And now I'm speaking US statistics in, in particular. Um, tend to be more reliable. In the electricity space, you tend to lose power less. Fewer shutoffs, as Anne was just mentioning. Uh, so it stays accessible and affordable to folks, including low income folks. Not always more innovative. Anne was talking about, I think in Paris, they were able to create a more innovative uh, apparatus, governance apparatus, as well as um, as, uh, as, as well as the management and, and with the users, and we'll talk more about that. But, um, but oftentimes they are innovative. And I think that, you know, we're not romanticizing or idealizing the public sector. It's got a lot of problems. It's had a lot of failures. But they put us, the public model puts us in a much better position to carry out the democratization and to carry out this kind of understanding of resources as a commons, both on the ecological side as well as on the human side. I mean, we can see, you know, and then there's the nitty gritty of the rates are cheaper. If you look at rates in the public power versus the investor owned utility in the United States, it's cheaper. Public power is cheaper. Why? You're not paying out that dividend. Con Ed always loved to brag about the dividend. It's sending out, you know, almost every year to its shareholders um, while it keeps those costs just a little, just a little bit higher. Um, so you get to control the surplus in a public power uh, or in a public water utility operation, right? The surplus belongs to the public. And if it's democratically managed, that's a very powerful thing. Great, thank you so much, both of you. Um, so you, you've given us a lot of um, really powerful specific examples, um, you know, including affordability, including issues of, um, you know, fighting against um, uh, what some people call energy or water poverty, right? You know, like uh, cutoffs uh, for people who can't afford basic utilities and, and refusing to do that. These are all really, really powerful things. Um, but as you both pointed out, there's also a kind of ideological dimension, right? You know, challenging neoliberalism, challenging the idea that corporations are the best and most nimble at doing things. And, and out of that comes a whole kind of Pandora's box of possibilities for thinking about the common good and, and the commons and doing politics differently, right? So publici uh, publicizing or, or remunicipalizing or making democratic public services has so much possibility for broader um, transformations of our, our societies. Um, very, very exciting stuff. Um, I just wanted to note to everybody um, uh, that I, I put the link to your amazing booklet um, in the chat. Um, I 
believe that Aaron put it up there previously, but that was a link to registration. I think I have the correct link there. So um, everybody who wants to um, download um, Anne and Mike's um, wonderful um, publication, you can access it there. Um, OK, well, I wondered uh, if we could talk a little bit about some of the kind of nitty gritty elements of um, uh, this transformation um, and this making public of an essential service. Um, and you've already talked about some of these elements, um, you know, uh, about ensuring democratic public management, for instance. But I wondered if you could talk in a little bit more detail about, you know, what, what the new governance structure can really look like and flesh out some of these ideas of um, how to make um, public uh, utilities genuinely democratic, right? Because, you know, the, the kind of arguments that justified neoliberalism were always that um, public utilities and public forms of governance in general were kind of unresponsive, corrupt, didn't actually function, and that we're going to get more democracy, more responsiveness through, you know, um, giving our souls away to big corporations, right? So um, what, what did you do actually to show that those arguments were, were false? Yeah, so thank you for the question because it's true that usually the you know the neoliberal thinking is okay we have more uh, innovation and efficiency and transparency and accountability for, in, in private sector and and it's absolutely not true and we wanted and it was very important for for us we wanted to show that it, it's, a, it's a wrong idea and, and that we can have much more transparent and uncountable service uh, in Paris now, and it's the case. So how we, we did that? Uh, in the design of the, of the new model of the public sector for, for the Parisian water service, for public policy. So the governance was a key issue. Uh, and our guiding principle was to set up uh, new uh, governance structures under the edges of elected uh, representative and allowing public participation and active engagement of all water service stakeholders. And in the policy making process, not only by, a, like, you know, in consultation, just like, a, you know, uh, some communication process. So, um in two ways we were focused on two ways first the board the board of directors because it's a very important uh, decision body and now the board is open to all the stakeholders what does it mean uh before and, and you know usually the tradition uh was uh, we, we compose the boards of director with solely uh, solely elected officials so now of course we have elected official, a municipal um, opposition and, and municipal majority, of course. But we decided to, to add uh, seats for users, association, and staff. So now we have all these uh, representatives uh, of, uh, of staff, two representatives uh, for the staff, and they are elected within the company, uh, the company's work council, is, is not only uh, is, is not an obligation to have uh, unionists. Usually, there are unionists, but uh, it's it's a uh, it's a, the work uh, the company the company staff uh, which organize the election. We have a representative from the civil society. So, to be honest, and for for a, it's it's a long story. So I think I don't have time to explain why at the beginning. Uh, you know, the, the so civil society association uh, didn't want to be uh, part of the new board because it's, it's not a tradition. It's not, yes, it's not usual. And they are quite, um, you know, not scary, but they, they didn't want to, to give up their independence, their independent votes. So we decided to convince them uh, to have a consultative uh, right, a consultative vote. Uh, and after one year, when they discover that they really could have 
uh, absolutely independent uh, writing vote in, in the board. So uh, they decided to be fully member of the board. So we have UFC Que Choisir a France Nature Environnement. And UFC Que Choisir is the biggest uh, consumer uh, consumer uh, association uh, at France Nature Environnement, the environmental association, uh, the most important also in France. And we have also a seat for l'Observatoire Parisien de l'eau, so the Parisian Water Observatory Associate, and I will uh, discuss uh, on this observatory. And for me, it's very important because this board is, you know, we, we as you know, uh, the board is an important uh, decision uh, decision making uh, making tool because all the strategic decisions, the business plan, uh, investment programming, strategic policies are debated uh, within the board, and all the members have exactly the same uh, the same right. Uh, they, there are a total transparency, a, a full transparency uh, on, on the data, documents, and reports, and it's a very, very important. If you want to have a, 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 a real democratization of the decision-making process, the first step is to have a, a transparency on, on data, uh, yes, and data, documents, reports, and everything. It's it's a it's the first principle, and beside the the board, beside the board, we have now uh, an observatory. So it's a it's a new actor, absolutely new actor in the in the water sector. And this uh, Persian Water Observatory uh, is uh, designed to be a consultative uh, body. So it's not. Uh, uh, fully for many reasons, I, I don't explain right now. Uh, so it, it's not a, a writing uh, writing body, but it's a consultative body. But all the important deliberation, uh, you know, pacing by uh, pacing uh, and dis and debating uh, fr in front of uh, before the the parliament should be discussed and agreed in the observatory. And the observatory is composed with academics and unionists, uh, um, employees, uh, of course, civil society. Every everybody can be a member of the observatory. So uh, a Parisian, uh, you know, like uh, uh, yes, only one Parisian can can be a member. Uh, they they vote for for their president. So it's, it's not an, an elected position. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, yes, it's a, a peer, it's, it's a peer association, and uh, and organized by the members, and they can't ask uh, any any topic to be discussed uh, among uh, among the members, so they have a, a quite a big role uh, monitoring. Uh, monitoring the uh, the activities and the operation of, of the of the service which is very important and also a voice to a guide uh, to guide the uh, the policies uh, relate uh, all the water related uh, policies in, in paris so I can discuss maybe in more details, but it's it's a main it's a main principle, and we have now with with that we have like a more a balance you know more power balance and for me it was very important, and it was not it wasn't easy to be honest to convince that we need to uh, to set up this new body, because it's time consuming because it means that. You know, any yeah, member of the observatory can uh, ask any information and uh, of course can, can require more transparency and more explanation on, on this policy and this measure. And so we have now, like I say, like a free fit. So it means the administration, so the technical, uh, the technical poll. Uh, we have the political level, and we have the civil society, pub public 
uh, level. And for me, it's very important, like, uh, you know, to have a, a discussion and sharing and to, to, do, to try to share as much as possible uh, information and power to, to guide the new water policy in Paris. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, yeah, it's, it's an absolutely fascinating um, series of developments. Um, it makes me think about the fact that we're coming up to the 20th anniversary of um, Hillary Wainwright's um, book called uh, Reclaim the State, Experiments in Popular Democracy. Um, and I, I think you've, you've taken some of the things that she first tried to discuss and um, kind of call for so far in the work that you've done um, in Paris. It's, it's super exciting and a huge inspiration to people in many other places. Um, uh, I wanted to turn to Mike now and ask Actually, him. Actually, could I just jump in on that point real quick? Yeah, yeah, sure. Because I, I love the reference to Hillary, Hillary Wainwright, absolutely, who was very involved in the global justice movement as well as doing that research with the Transnational Institute, who's a big influence for, for me and for Anne, I know. Um, and in my book, We Decide, um, I have a chapter on what I call disarticulating the state. I think I don't want to reclaim it. I want to break it a little bit, but kind of make it evolve. <laughs> and I sent that chapter to Anne when, we, when I found out she was in New York and she emailed me back. She's like, this is good, but I have a lot of questions. And I was like, okay, this is, <laughs> this is cool. And that's kind of how we, that's kind of how we connected. Cause I'm like, oh, wow, that's, uh, yes, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I, I think that, but, but it goes back to Hillary Wainwright. I know Thomas Hanna is doing work on this now. He's done on, on uh, his book I got over here, Our Commonwealth about this tradition. Joanna Bozua, who's a mutual friend, right? She's doing research on it. There's some folks doing some great research. We're right, trying to contribute to that. So uh, just shout out to, to some of those folks. But go ahead, Ashley. Great, thanks so much, Mike. And and and, yeah, and Ashley's work. And Ashley's work. Extreme cities. Come on. Well, there 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 are a lot of people thinking about these issues right now. Um, and of course, it, it it's an exciting time, both in terms of the kind of practical application of a lot of this work, um, the kind of activist level, but also it raises a lot of theoretical questions. Um, and you know. In my book on people's power, I, I um, reference Nikos Polansis and his theories, which come out of the 1970s and kind of autonomous struggles in relation to the state. So yeah, these questions of how to disarticulate or reclaim or you know um, stay separate from while putting pressure on the state, these are all important kind of philosophical questions which have so much resonance and importance um, right now in the, in the present moment um, you know, as kind of generation left um, struggles with um, making some kind of headway around the Green New Deal. And we'll come back to those big issues. But before we get into them, I, I wanted to turn a little bit um, to you, Mike, and ask you to, um, speaking of, of articulating and disarticulating, I want you to maybe unpack for us a little bit um, the kind of energy sector in the US, right? Because it's very different from, from water um, in general, but specifically in, in Paris. Um, and it can often be a kind of alphabet soup of different acronyms um, uh, that in some ways are kind of purposely obfuscatory so that the average person can't really understand what, what's going on other than getting a rate bill, which is too high every month and, and knowing that they're getting gouged one way or another. Um, so maybe could you give us a bit of a sense of the lay of the land and you know, what stakes there are? Yeah, so for a long time in the United States, it was, you know, there were indep well, there's always been a tradition of publicly owned utilities and investor owned utilities. And coming out of you know, the first wave of the public ownership preceded FDR, but then FDR also kicked it into gear and got some more action going on it. And then there's this kind of for 60, uh, for 50 years or so, there's a kind of dominant model, which is a privately owned utility and a state regulatory body called the Public Service Commission or the Public Utility Commission. And if you can kind of think like, what's the scariest, most unaccountable version of government I can imagine, this was probably it. It was some weird set of, of dudes on this, you know, in this position that was appointed by the governor, some are elected, and you didn't really know who they were, and they had all this stuff that they were supposed to do. And basically, they were set up to cut a deal with the, with the IOUs, right, to, um, uh, with the independent uh, uh, investor-owned utilities to make sure they make consistent profits 
and we're going to make sure that you, you know, you're, you're pretty good to your customer, but what's not going to get crazy. And so this deal fell apart in 1978 or started to fall apart um, or was unwound in particular ways in 1978 with federal law uh, under the Carter administration, which gets called PURPA, which allowed for independent generators to have to come onto the mix. So it, you didn't have to, the utility didn't dominate all of what was being generated in terms of electricity. And what that meant though, is that the market was really came into being uh, at least on generation of electricity that could then be sold uh, on a market that was either in the state or in a group of states uh, to utilities to deliver to your house or to your business. So the states have their public service commissions, which is supposed to watch the consumers and watch the, the utilities and make sure they're, they're doing their thing and it's reliable service. But then there are these independent service operators or retail trade organizations that operate within a state or in a group of states that actually, that's where everybody sells the stuff. They, they bid, there's prices every day before, you know, the day before you have to arrange who else, who's gonna have so much electricity on the next day. And it's a really complicated sort of semi-market, it's not a full market, um, semi-market operation. And so there are these RTOs and the ISOs. And in New York State, we have our own, it's the independent, um, independent service operator. And then New England has a group, you know, together and PJM and Pennsylvania with a few other states, they have theirs. Um, there's one city, by the way, that has its own ISO um, and that's Los Angeles, which is interesting because Los Angeles has some of the most ambitious climate goals. And they also have a publicly owned utility, both in terms of water and electricity. So, so that's a bit of the soup. I, I think the other key acronym there in the soup is FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And they tend to not exert themselves too much, but with the Biden administration having actual climate goals in the energy space, they've started to up their game to some extent. And he would have an office of engagement, especially when it comes to the siting of electricity generation and, and, and also energy, right? Especially natural gas pipelines, that kind of stuff. So when we think about democratization and was talking about the particular level of the utility and then this accompanying institution of the observatory, which we'll be talking more about later. But unfortunately, electricity, there's a lot of other levels that you got to figure out what are you going to do in terms of democratizing them and making them accountable. And they tend to be very technical um, or they tend to be very market oriented. And as those are these independent service operators and the retail trade or, uh, tra tra transmission organizations, um, as well as the more traditional public service commissions. Okay, great. Um, and you know, uh, when we have time for question and answer, folks may want to um, jump in with with questions around these complex arrangements. But I, I want to move things back to end because. Um, there is a, a lively campaign right now in New York State for public power. Um, so to, to kind of challenge this entire infrastructure that you were just describing for us, Mike. Um, and you know, thanks to your work with Anne, one of the things that the public power campaign is thinking about doing is setting up some kind of observatory. You know, I'm very much uh, uh, inspired by your work and with the water observatory. So. What would you say to activists here or, or, you know, in some other place about why an observatory is so absolutely key and what are the elements that you think um, could be transported to another context or should be transported to another context um, in setting up some kind of democratic utilities observatory? Mm, no, you're right that the context is... Uh, is always different. So we have a uh, difference in, yes, in, uh, in terms of institution, administration, for example, we don't have this uh, a similar re regulatory body like, like in US. So we don't have exactly the same actors and the same, yes, the same players in the sector. But uh, the common, uh, we have a common thing, sure, unfortunately, that we don't have enough public participation. So this observatory, uh, observatory, I think is, is a, an example and, uh, and can be translated in different contexts. Uh, an example to, uh, to yes, for, for the first time in Paris, we have 
a body where uh, different kind of stakeholders and uh, and users and uh, uh, yes unionists academics are already already told can provide expertise and policy and governance issue uh, can also uh, present new uh, topics or subject for the city council to debate and decide uh, so and as i already mentioned uh, all acts and reports and uh, uh, official proceedings related to water policy must be uh, sub submitted to the observatory before they are considered by the city council so it's a uh, it's a new player, and now it's not possible to just uh, be pass, you know, be pass. Yes, be pass. You know, this uh, this actor, and just to say, we are only between technician and elected official uh, for uh, for the designing uh, for designing the uh, the policies. So I think it's that's that's uh, the main goal. Uh, the, to yes, the, the observatory is an, an important uh, uh, body for that, and I, I I noticed that if I if I see the reluctance from uh, at the beginning from uh, the administration, the reluctance from some other actors to have this new body, I I conclude. I conclude that it means that it's important to have this body because it means that he can have some power. Because and and I and to be honest, it's, a, it's of course it's not perfect, but he has influenced other cities and other countries. For example, in, in the in the essay I wrote with uh, with Mike, I mentioned uh, Terrassa. Uh, terrassa, te terrassa experience, uh, remunicipalization and democratization, and te terrassa uh, observatory. I think it's a. To, I, I think it's it's it it works better than Parisian one now, uh, and uh, and so it means that I I hope that uh, in different contexts we can have this kind of of body, uh, and to also to. To try to to offer uh, to offer a, a training also because I think this body is important not only for uh, overviewing you know for an overview for monitoring the the policy but also really to uh, uh, to add new inputs new insight uh, it's it's very yes it's for me it's, it's a goal you know to to have. A, a new way of thinking public policies, including and and I think for that we need to include new actors, because it's not possible to have only, you know, technical uh, view of, of of the of the policy of policy. So this body is also a, a way, a, a way to to yes to to have a new thinking to address. To address uh, new challenges, you know. So, and uh, so it's yes, it's one of one of the reasons. It's not so easy sometimes because what does it mean? It means that they have some training also, because I I, I mentioned that uh, a key of the success is to share information, to share uh, data, to share. But also, I think we we need to share, you know. Um, Maria, knowledge and knowledge and to, so what does it mean? It mean we need to 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 have trainings, trainings how we can deal with this with new issue, with sometimes very technical subject. So training is also important and one of the key of this I think success to for this body because sometimes it's for, for, uh, in Paris I really insist and focus my my you know my my colleague, I, I focus to, to make readable the report. And it could be like a detail, but it's not a detail, you know. We have annual reports and annual, uh, yes, documents, you know, regarding uh, all the operation investment and, uh, and strategic um, uh, policy. And if you try to make readable 
of this report. So it means, okay, it's a first step to share the knowledge and after to share the power to decide. Great, yeah, so you, you need to have a knowledge commons if you're gonna have a, a functioning commons. Um, I, I really appreciate that point. Um, time is um, going quickly and I wanna make sure that we have enough um, left for a, a robust question and answer. So I, I think I'll, I'll just put one final question on the table um, and, and put it out for, there for both of you. Um, I think you've both been already answering this question in, in different ways throughout the course of our conversation. But um, uh, <clears throat> I'm interested in issues of environmental justice and injustice, right? Um, and, and particularly around um, the public sector um, and around utilities. These issues seem more burning than ever today. Um, so why is something like um, electricity or water um, such a site of injustice and how can democratizing it create um, a, a more egalitarian and just society? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump first. I mean, pollution, who gets polluted, who gets the clean stuff, who gets the high quality stuff, who gets the degraded stuff, who's, get, who's gets shut off and who gets subsidized? Um, who gets the jobs? How good are the jobs? Who owns the infrastructure in electricity and in water? There's opportunities now for local ownership in different types of ways. Who gets that? Is it privately owned? Is it only for upper middle class homeowners? Is it for low income folks in buildings, uh, for renters? And you know, there's some, been some great work in this field. There are great movements and organizations in this field in New York City and across the United States. Uh, Shalanda Baker's book, I got this over here somewhere too. Revolutionary Power, I think it's called, uh, is a great book on the energy sector in this space, looking at the Gulf Coast, but also looking nationally in Hawaii, some great examples. So these are all, these are all ways in which electricity intersects with, with environmental justice. And then when you throw climate change on top of it, which is going to throw hazards and intensify vulnerabilities across the space, who's more likely to live in coastal areas? African-Americans are, Latinos are in the United States. Um, who's more likely to be subject to heat island impacts, right? If you're in an urban area, um, especially. And those play out racially as well. So utilities as managers of the common and as, 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 as entities that are supposed to have these democratic inputs need to make sure that they're putting together projects and, and policies that are addressing those communities, those frontline communities and putting them at the center on this. And I think that, you know, going to the observatory, and I see a question from, from John Highland. Hi, John. Um, you know, to deal with this stuff, John's absolutely right, which is that, and this is what the observatory does, just to say another word on it, is that this is an entity that has a relationship with the utility, but is independent of it. And it's a place where education can happen, where student fellowships and environmental justice can happen, like they do in Austin, Texas like where the community of black owned businesses can participate in business development like they do in LA. And you can see little examples of this in the United States, but the observatory brings these all together so that you can have the collaborative projects with the community. Participatory budgeting is one way you could do that with an observatory. Where you're doing the collaborative research with the community, like Anne was talking about, bringing in the expertise of farmers who are by the watershed or low income households that are suffering from poor water quality. Um, and it's an also a place where you can monitor the observatory, or sorry, monitor the, the utility. The utility. To make, yeah, to, to make sure that they're abiding by the values that you set up for them in that democratically elected board, which is also supposed to be multi, you know, multi-constituency stakeholder. So, and John's right, this is the part of the public sector, right? In New York City, this means CUNY's involved. This means SUNY's involved. This means the public sector unions are involved. That's how it works. And so you're educating your members and creating this ecosystem of public actors to do this. This is not something you create the ideal utility, then it's done. It's a whole ecosystem of actors. Great, thanks. Um, and would you like to weigh in here at all? I, I fully agree. <laughs> I fully agree with Mike. Uh, no, I, I fully agree. I think uh, it, it's very important to, to now in, in politics to find, uh, you know, to find, mm, to find uh, innovative 
innovative tools and to set up new policy uh, to, to address our, uh, our main challenges and what, what is our main and key challenges uh, we are facing is a climate change, loss of biodiversity, and also like a, a, a legitimacy crisis, you know, democracy crisis. So I think if we have this, yes, if we if we bear that in mind, if we keep that in mind, we 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 can find, you know, um, we we can organize our uh, our. Um, Democracy. Uh, we can organize uh, our democracy in a, in, a, in new shapes, and 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 organizing our democracy with new shapes and with new bodies and new entities like observatory. We we can call that in in, uh, in another world with another wo uh, world. But the point is, we have absolutely uh, to to be much more aggressive. On, on, a, on a new agenda and not to let you know the neoliberal agenda uh, win because uh, we, we saw that it's a, it's a crisis. So uh, democracy and public management uh, can't be uh, come on again. yes can go together, go together, go together to, to find the, uh, find out the, uh, the way the way to yeah. Yeah, and just a quick point on this, Ashley, because I think utilities are maybe not seen enough as strategic places for democratization processes that have so influence, so much influence on the economy, right? Who gets subsidized for water, as you mentioned, who gets subsidized for electricity, have big impacts on the economy. And so that's one dimension. And I think the, the other is just to come back to your, your New York State. So one of the successes in this last budget, which was a complex mix and not good for climate, that's for sure. Um, and a lot of, of uh, egregious failures um, to address the kind of stuff we're talking about in New York State, I'm talking about the New York State budget. But one thing that did pass is a bill to transform the electric utility of Long Island, where I live, and uh, the campaign to reimagine Long Island. I think there's a few people on this webinar from that. Thank you for coming right on. And, um, and our bill got passed to create a commission to, to figure out the exact plan to transform this thing into a fully democratic public utility to get rid of the IOU, PSE, and G, and to create an observatory. And so, and I know that folks in the public power campaign, we've had a lot of discussions about what the observatory would look like there. And this gets into a lot of nitty-gritty questions in New York State. What about NYSERDA? What, what about CUNY? What about the Public Service Commission? And so we've been getting into that, and people have been doing great work on that. So we're getting down to business soon on this commission um, over the summer to really hammer this stuff out. Great, thanks. Um, that's really exciting. Um, uh, good to hear about a victory um, in times that um, on so many fronts are, are fairly dark. Um, I, I also wanted to um, note that um, Ariel, uh, Ariella Lawson put um, a link in the chat to Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, which if folks don't know about, is a wonderful resource um, for thinking about struggles for um, control, democratic and, and public control of utilities um, around the world. Um, that raises an important question for me, um, if I can just uh, jump off that reference. Um, uh, what about um, labor and its role in, in this transition? Um, uh, I'll, I'll start taking questions. Um, uh, if you wanna put your questions into the Q&A function um, or into the chat, um, uh, looks like we've got some uh, ones coming up. Uh, I see one from Rebecca and one from Amber. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll give folks who um, uh, have asked questions precedence. Um, and you already answered one from John Hyland, Mike. So um, Rebecca Bratsby's asks, um, uh, Mike, what possibility do you see for an observatory like structure here in New York? Where do you see the leverage points? And Amber Ruther um, says um, that in your book, you recommend um, mostly directly electing board members. How would you address the challenge that elections are often won by candidates with the most money? And how would you prevent the election of bad actors backed by the fossil fuel industry, especially for a statewide election? 
couple of challenging questions. So uh, I'll take Rebecca's first because that's funner and friendlier. Um, but I appreciate the question, Amber. Um, I think, and, and by the way, trade unions for energy democracy done huge work in this space. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg has has been um, partnering with them and been you know a vehicle for their publications. I've learned a lot from Sean Sweeney uh, and his work, and he actually did one of the first forums where I've, I I learned a lot about this stuff. So they're another fantastic actor in the mix, and of course on the on the union side. Um, in the international context and all the geopolitics around that, right? So I think um, with Rebecca's question, um, so in New York State, there's supposed to be a New York Energy Policy Institute based at SUNY Stony Brook, and it's not functioning. So we, and I've talked to them, and so we already have the designation for a space. CUNY could partner with that. It, I, I see it as really a pub, public sector, public university partnership. And it will require a budget that's that's significant, over a million dollars for sure. We've done a lot of the, the math on this. And it could be funded out of the ratepayer fund of the Long Island Power Authority. So if we're thinking about an observatory, just, just to take the Long Island context where it's live. Um, and what you're like, oh, well, why would they pay for that, right? And it's going to cost more? No. Because right now, the Department of Public Service of New York State has a Long Island office. And they don't really do anything that we really need them to do. And their budget is $6 million a year, $6 million. So we only need one or two to actually get a real deal observatory in place to go partner with the university. You already have a lot of these university connections there. And then to really be a collaborative relationship with the Long Island Power Authority, but then also a place that's owned by the people. And where uh, all the good folks can come to learn about this stuff to, to you know, from, uh, you know, the energy conservation programs to green jobs and so on. We see a lot of these programs dispersed, right? And it, it, it spins your head because you don't know where things are. If you centralized it in one institutional framework, it would be a lot more accessible to people in lots of different ways. And you could create education around it in a deeper way if it's affiliated with the public universities. This is why you need the new deal for, uh, for CUNY. Um, and we didn't get it. We did not get what we should have gotten out of this budget. Uh, so we'll be pushing next time uh, for this governor, but it, it's gonna require the public sector, public universities to really, really be able to house this. And then of course, with your community-based organizations who have been leaders in this space already uh, in New York City uh, and on Long Island and across the state. Um, I mean, real quick on the elections, you know, yes, Amber, um, this is a real deal. I think that if there was an observatory, another thing that it could do is a real place for public learning and, and, and public debate and education so that people would have the wherewithal to approach a lot of the technical issues in this space. And then also a place to hold folks running for those positions accountable to them. It's a place where the debates could be hold, held and the forums could be held because you're gonna have shenanigans in elections. I had to say this, right? Um, and from all different kinds of angles. So you need a trusted civil society partner to navigate that, to navigate that. And maybe they approve, maybe they certify certain candidates or maybe they you know, endorse certain candidates. I don't know, that's for folks to decide. Um, but that's, that's kind of my quick reply to that. Great, thanks. Um, uh, really interesting. And uh, anything you want to pick up there? Or um, I could ask you to field Ariella's very interesting question about thinking more broadly about urban democracy and how various different pieces fit together. Um, and perhaps thinking about housing, for instance, as a public utility. What might transformations in, in one sector do to advance struggles in another? Um, do you have a sense from your experience in um, uh, government in Paris of how these different struggles might create some sort of synergy or are they really separate from one another? Mm, that, no, they are really separate <laughs> from one another. And uh, so no, they are separate. And even in some time there are some, uh, cross-cutting issue, of course. Uh, uh, for, for example, we, we decided to 
for, for to, to address climate change issue in uh, in Paris and we have also more and more uh, heat waves and we 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 began to uh, to think how we can use, for example, the, uh, the sanitation and the sewer, uh, sewer water, uh, sewer water, first of all, to make energy, so like a renew renewable energy, and also, and to use water, so uh, non-drinkable water, but not sewer water, non-drinkable water, to uh, to decrease uh, the temperature when there is a heat wave. So there are more and more uh, cross-cutting issue between urban policy and water and sanitation uh, policies. And it's not only thanks to the observatory, but the observatory can also be a, a right entity uh, to, to, discuss, to discuss this cross-cutting issue because if we can have, and it was for it was very important also for me to to try, not to try, but to have you know um, different point of view from different uh, stakeholders, but also from different uh, sectors. It means we can have urbanist, architect, uh, gardener, or also a teacher. Uh, housing planner in the observatory. So, and, and so the first time we, we succeed to have that. And, and it's, uh, it, this entity and this entity, and also the, the fact that we have different kind of expertise and knowledge and, uh, and background, and background on the um, municipal issue, we, uh, we could have uh, conferences on and public and uh, policy and municipal policy, thinking how we can have uh, more com com um, on, yeah. complete, uh, on, yeah. exhaustive, exhaustive, uh, exhaustive policy uh, fighting climate issue and urban policy. So, so it's it's a right. Also, it's it's a right tool to to do that to discuss that thank you so much um to follow up on ariel's question i, I want to um ask mike um could a public power um entity um which obviously you know we we want to have something like that because we need kind of grid scale transformation to renewable um, energy and all of the economic benefits um, for frontline communities that that can bring, but could a public power utility also be um, uh, helping to empower um, collectives, solar collectives, in other words, kind of reaching down to the grassroots and, and helping people build up towards um, the grid uh, in various different ways? Yes, and I see there's a question from Lorenzo Christoph. Hi, Lorenzo, uh, who's done great work in this in California, both in the in the Public Service Commission and also writing. And I cite him in our in our essay. Um, that's a problem we can definitely deal with. I think that the you know the unions is and I see another question on the unions and the unions is a honestly tough situation. Hello, New York State budget. You know the last three days, um, and that's going to take a space of collaboration which we don't have right now to be honest, we need to figure out a better space for discussion and collaboration for that. Um, I would say on the what's called the distributed energy resources or uh, distributed generation DER and public power, there's I think a false, there's kind of a, some false uh, uh, competition there, you know what I mean? The false dichotomies rather that, oh, we, you know, we need to all go distributed and that gets rid of the utility, no. We need utilities. We need to be. We need them to evolve in this space, along with the public services commissions and so on. But I think there is great potential for utilities to support distributed energy resources. And this gets technical, but to keep it just in this in this sort of more basic level, in the way that it used to be thought that you know a lot of the, if people get solar in their own homes that they don't depend on the grid. People still depend on the grid. So how can you have distributed energy resources like that you know, small scale solar, community scale solar that make the grid more resilient, right? This is what Texas lacked when the, when the winter storm hit there uh, a year and a half ago. The whole thing goes down, right? And 
we can do that where people do have more autonomy and also have a grid which is then more reliable and more, especially in the face of the challenges that it has vis-a-vis -vis climate. But utilities have to do a serious committed job of making sure that it goes to community ownership, community owned solar, that's actually helping EJ communities, which right now it doesn't always in New York state, including where I live in Long Island, or maybe even better to solar cooperatives like Co-op Power, which works in the North Northeast region, and the New York City Community Energy Cooperative, which works in New York City, where it does go to low-income communities, Sunset Park, Central Brooklyn, um, partner with Uprose, partner with WEAC, great partners, and, and is doing it. But guess what? Con Ed, I don't know how to put this politely, is not the best partner for a lot of these projects. And their folks still waiting for their credits from the solar that they got installed in their building. You need the public entities here to be really collaborative in this space. And it's, and it's really a mutual benefits across the system situation, if you could do that, with the so-called energy democracy folks and the so-called public power folks coming together. Great point. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, I just wanted to note to everybody that Ariella put up uh, a link to an interesting um, event on municipalism that's going to be happening on May 1st. Um, I think there are some really interesting kind of parallels with the conversation we've been having. Um, I've been uh, doing some research recently on um, uh, organizations in Uruguay, which, by the way, has 100% renewable power. Um, but in addition, they also have a very active um, uh, kind of mutual aid housing sector. So the government will loan money to um, cooperatives of folks who are building houses themselves in these um, mutual aid societies, and then they'll build their own houses. So there's, there's an interesting kind of parallel to exactly what you were just saying, Mike, about how this could all work in the renewable energy space. Um, so that, you know, um, democratizing control of state power can also lead to support for grassroots initiatives. And so those things shouldn't be seen as antithetical at all. In fact, they can work hand, hand in hand in a really nice way. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. Um, I think we may have gotten to the end of questions. I could be wrong. Let me see. Um, okay, yeah, I think we've gotten to the end of questions. If anybody um, else has another question, please feel free to um, put it in the chat um, or in the Q&A. Um, in the meantime, um, Anne and Mike, um, what is the future of public power, right? Um, as we've alluded to, and you said at the very outset of your presentation, and, um, you know, the, the political um, future is, is somewhat bleak, um, not just because of the recent elections in France, but, you know, uh, here in the United States, of course, um, Build Back Better is just not happening. The kind of Green New Deal is pretty much dead in the water. Um, and instead, we see this horrible inter-imperialist competition, you know, with, you um, uh, Putin's invasion of, of Ukraine, um, and that has uh, really supported fossil capitalism, right, with um, people arguing in Western Europe, well, we need more access to liquefied natural gas from the U.S. and other places, and in the U.S. it's, you know, drill, baby, drill. So what is, what is the future, um, uh, given these challenges, um, and uh, is public power on a different scale, um, like a smaller scale, an alternative to these um, uh, bleak scenarios or some kind of promise for future political transformation? Well, what is the future? Mm. Okay, it's not, I think it's not the good day to, to ask me this, this, <laughs> this question. <laughs> But uh, now I'm not very I'm not very optimistic about the future. But I'm I'm definitely sure that the future has to be public. So and and we have to invent a new public. So I definitely sure of that because if, if for example, if I take the example of France, one of why we we are you know in this election sequence uh, sequence in France why why a left and, and the green, the left coalition and left and the green coalition as, you know, are not the, the winner because I think we, we didn't do, uh, you know, the, come on here, yeah, the, the important work on thinking how we can't 
uh, imagine uh, how we can think, how we can design new policy for people, you know. And it's not only, you know, we, it's, we have a lot of good speeches, and especially in France, because we love that, you know, and uh, okay, so good speeches, but concretely, what does it mean? Uh, even in France, I think it's, it's worst here, but even in France, we have, uh, you know, more and more uh, social inequalities, uh, more and more environmental crises, and what, uh, what can we do? And I think we need to go back on the ground and to uh, discuss uh, with the population and uh, say, okay, for the uh, basic public services, because I, I'm very focused on that, for the basic public services, but what does it mean? Water, sanitation, energy, uh, housing, we need to figure out how we can design new model, new system, maybe more, decentra more, uh, more decentralized, more collaborative, more democratized, but I think it's the only, for me, it's the only, comment dire, la voie de sortie. I don't know how can say that, but it's the only path, for, a political path to, to imagine the future, public, democratized, and uh, aware uh, on, on the challenges we are facing. Yeah, and, and in our book booklet, it's 100 pages, so you know it's a, it's a weird length in a way, or in-between length, but in chapter two, where Anne writes about the Paris um, experience, there are a lot of nitty gritty details on the role of the Green Party, what the communists were doing, what was the city government officials doing? And those are the kinds of details that we need to be able to understand and articulate what has to be done. And again, not just gloss it out, oh, it'll be democratic, it'll be great, and we'll survey every, you know, but the actual details, including the fights, as well as the successes. And so I think that that's, I just want to make sure people, you know, to note that, to really go to that chapter two, because that's the longest, you know, that's the, the best, most detailed description of what happened in Paris in English. Um, and we're very proud to have that in, in the piece. I think this also goes, you know, to, to I see questions from my colleague, Nancy Romer uh, and, and Toby Block, Toby Shepard Block, um, and hello to both. And I think that when we think about engagement, and we got, a, we got a lot of details on this too, a lot of people don't care about this stuff. They don't want to come to this. Why would they? And, and if they weren't interested, is it really going to change anything, right? There's no shortcuts here. We have a, we have a cultural transformation that's really required, and, and that requires a discourse around public goods that we still can't quite get going in the United States. We get glimpses of it essential workers and basic goods and basic income and so on. And we need more articulators of this. We have one right here, uh, very proud to say Ashley Dawson is one of the articulators of this, of getting this discourse going around an area lost in high area, um, mentioned municipalism. That's a language that's taken off a little bit more in Europe than it has in the United States, but, but nevertheless, there's another discourse. So I would say that, I mean, I think the other thing around engagement, and this is going more to Nancy Romer's question, and I've been very inspired to work with the Central Brooklyn effort around public health. It involves the hospitals, involves universities, small businesses, and it's got a real economic democracy framework to it. And one of the things they do there is participatory action research, which is also an expertise of the graduate, CUNY Graduate Center. And what that means is that you train the young people to do research in the area, right? You don't have the experts come do power presentations to the young people. You do maybe one of those. But then you train them in they're in high school to do these research projects on these topics, on energy democracy, on the social determinants of health, on public power. And we put in for a grant, we'll see how this goes in the next, you know, next couple of weeks, we're waiting to hear back. But this is, this is just one example of the type of engagement that we're talking about, where you're actually, you're, you're, you're empowering and educating a whole group of folks in the school's context about this, as well as public and civil society events. And that's what it's going to take. And because, and, and then once you, once you engage in the research on that, right, you have a pipeline of folks who are trained in this area. So we get into these details in, uh, in, the, in the essay about how do you get people to come out? How do you get people to participate over the long haul in a situation that's volatile and only going to get worse? Well, when everybody's electric rates goes up 25 to 37%, guess what? Everybody starts looking at their electric bill. Imagine if the electric bill said, hey, come to our next meeting. We converted this thing into a public owned democratic utility. Come, 
right? That's what you want to see. You don't want to see Con Ed. You want to see that, right? So I think that's another part of it. And participatory budgeting, you know, uh, uh, we've talked about, Ann and I talked about, and that's kind of one of my areas. That's another example of a robust, engaging process that can be repeated year after year to keep people involved with this for the kind of long-term change that we need. Thanks, Mike. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I want to give Anne um, a, a chance to answer Nancy Romer's question, um, which I think is such an important one. Um, uh, she asks, what efforts did you need to employ in Paris to get people who needed to be on the observatory to actually volunteer to, to join it? And it, it seems to me this is really the kind of question of social reproduction, right? I mean, we live in a capitalist society that works us to the bone. And of course, the amount of labor we know is not <laughs> equally distributed. Um, communities of color and women by, uh, bear the, the greatest brunt. So we've talked about um, justice, um, particularly for um, uh, communities of color that are victimized and uh, uh, exploited in various different ways by the utilities that we have. But the, the kind of feminist questions um, that folks like Silvia Federici and Veronica Gago ask, I think are, are a key part of this discussion. How can you have participatory democracy? We really need to change a lot about our everyday uh, lives. Um, and that is gonna require uh, a big, <laughs> and one might even say revolutionary transformation. Um, but yeah, um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about specifically this kind of question of how you managed to get people to volunteer um, how people were able to find the time to participate um, uh, on a practical level. Was there some sort of um, payment which people got for being part of the observatory or was it purely on a volunteer basis? Oh, it's totally and um, fully in, in a voluntary basis. So there is no payment and uh, to, uh, and to be fully transparent, even me, when I uh, chair the, you know, the, 900 staff uh, utility, I wasn't paid because no nobody is paid. So it's like that in, in France, there is no, yes, there is no money for many things in the in public sector. So it's it's uh, for the board of directors, if in, even for the president and for the members of the observatory, no one is paid. So it means sometimes, yes, it's quite challenging to find people who wants to be involved. But I think the main point is not only the payment. I think we we sh maybe I think we we could and we maybe we should uh, thinking that to have some a little compensation. But it's not the main point. It's very hard when there is not a, a crisis. Uh, where there is no crisis, where there is that big issue. For everybody now in Paris, it works very well. Of course, it's not perfect, but it works very well. The rate is quite low, one of the lawyers in France. Uh, we have a good quality of water. We have long-term, uh, yes, long-term uh, environmental uh, conservation, preservation of the, of the water resources. We democratized the service. So for many people, it's, it works. And I, I remember I, I told my, my uh, activist and uh, academic friends, hey, folks, uh, please <laughs> just uh, try to be more involved in them. So they say, well, why? Because it works. So no need to be more involved. And I say, yes. But it's, it will be interesting for us to have, you know, different, as I said, different background and knowledge and blah, blah. So it's not easy. And I think one of the issue, and I, I'm, I, I'm and, uh, in Paris, it's not exactly the case, but I think we should have that. We should uh, to have this, come on here, uh, more decentralized, uh, decentralization of, of the observatory. It means maybe sometimes in schools, maybe sometimes in university, sometimes in, uh, I don't know, in uh, industrial service. So really, and not only, you know, uh, you know, in one place, one location, because I think we need to find other, uh, yes, other actors, other people. So, and to, to move, 
in the place where maybe in markets we have a lot in France we have a lot of you know markets and uh, yes so I think it's one of uh, of an option to have more spread you know not in one place but spread democratization uh, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Anne, and thank you, Mike. Your, your work is really a, a beacon of hope in a quite terrifying time. I, I think we need to wrap things up now um, and give the, uh, the, the uh, voice of authority back to Aaron of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Aaron, thank you so much for hosting this conversation. Um, I, I hope there will be similar conversations uh, with and, and Mike, um, in coming months, these are such important topics and their publication is, is so important for political movements here in the US and, and all around the world. So thank yes. you. And thank you all. And thank you, Ashley, for hosting us here today. This was really a wonderful conversation. And as we say in the intro to the book, we want this to be the start of more conversations around this. Um, there's a reason this was, we didn't wait for it to become a 300 page volume and a long book that would take time. We wanted it out in the world. And so um, just wanna plug it one more time. You can go to the rosalux.nyc website and order your free copy of the book. It'll be mailed to you. Um, so you can read it yourself, um, share it with any friends. Um, but yes, we do hope for this to be the start of many of these conversations and thank you three and thank all of our audience members for sticking with us for a really wonderful 90 minutes here. Um, so thank you all so much and check out our future events. We have an event tomorrow evening featuring a delegation from the PA, um, which are the Spanish housing activists who are going to be at Mayday space tomorrow evening, um, as well as they'll be in Philadelphia next weekend. We have a few different webinars coming up at RLS NYC. Um, but check our website. We have all of that available and all of that is great. And thank you all for joining and we hope to see you soon. Thanks again to Anne, Mike, and Ashley. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody.